So welcome back to DMDI. In this episode, we're getting the slab ready for the concrete, right? It was already pretty level, but you know, we've done a great job at getting it even more level. We're going for a four-inch slab. So we ran two wires or two strings going across, and then two strings also going diagonally. From there, we're able to check, you know, where we're low, where we're high. And we're doing it all by hand. You know, that's that's been the uh, prevailing theme, right? So we've been scraping it up with these shovels and rakes, getting all the dirt out. Most of the dirt though we were able to use for the driveway on this property. So we're, we're putting some more dirt, you know, it's more gravel right there, keeping it high over the culvert. But a lot of it also we're using to level the low spots. So we're just evening it out, right? And I'm sure, I'm sure way back when, um, they actually ha probably had it level, but you know, the ground gets adjusted and all that. We probably will be putting in a sewer area as well for a bathroom. And you know, we talked to some of the guys out here who work for the city and they pretty much said, better do it now than later, right? Having to cut up the concrete and stuff. So. Even if we don't use it and we choose to go with a little composting toilet or something, you know, it'll be good to have that there for even, you know, when we, if we end up selling the property and stuff, we're able to make more money doing that. So, yeah, we're going to go ahead and set up a time lapse, keep leveling it. And um, after we're done leveling it, we're going to put those form boards alongside the, the three inch tube steel at the bottom with one inch lower of, the, you know, the plywood for that. And I'm hoping those, that tube steel is strong enough to hold all that concrete, but we'll see, right? Um, so, yeah, we'll put the form boards on, then we'll do the rebar. And we're also gonna have to pour the uh, the ramp, the incline that goes up into the slab. We'll pour that first before we pour the slab, and then we'll use that kind of like a back a backboard. Pour. So yeah, we're gonna go and get working. Okay, so before we get into the pouring aspect, let's get into the uh, the math aspect, right? Now, the shed is approximately 25 feet by 30 feet. Dividing that into six sections would give us 120 square feet, roughly, right? However, that's the square footage, right? If we want to convert it into cubic feet, um, we multiply that by one for a foot thick, but we know it's not gonna be a foot thick. It's going to actually be four inches thick. So we divide 120 by three would give us 40 cubic feet, convert that into cubic yards, which I think is roughly 27 cubic feet per cubic yard. We get 1.5 cubic yards. So three, six, nine, nine cubic feet total, or four, I'm sorry, nine cubic yards total for the entirety of the shed. Now, now we have the cubic yards we're gonna need. Let's convert our mix ratio into how much of what materials we're gonna need. I know it's four inches thick and I wanted to do a mix ratio of one, four, five. I think that's actually slightly lower than um, like an M10 grade. So maybe M8 or something like that, right? Um, plenty enough, right, PSI to be able to withstand the, the light, light stuff I'm gonna be doing in there. Um, maybe 2,000 PSI, somewhere around there, right? Very cheap is, is the thing we're going for here, right? You gotta keep in mind, you know, you get a quote on a shed that big, four inches thick, all the rebar work and everything, and leveling out grade, it probably come out to about four or 5,000, at least where I live. Now, um, that can obviously vary depending on who you get to do the job and uh, where you live. But at a one four five ratio of Portland cement to sand and gravel, we're looking at 27 cubic feet per the one cubic yard. At 0.6 cubic feet per bag, we're looking at about 45 bags. 45 times $10 a bag, we're looking at about $450 just for the Portland cement. Now, that's the most expensive part, right? We also need four cubic yards of mason sand at about $30 a cubic yard, looking at $120. Same thing with gravel or the bridge stone, right? Five cubic yards times 30, we're looking at $150. And also the rebar, half inch thick, 20 foot, 20 of them, we're looking at about $300. So all in all, I spent $1,120 on this concrete. That's incredibly lower than um, what it would cost to get somebody to do it for me, obviously. But also um, getting a truck to come pour in there, right? That would probably be, for 10 cubic feet, maybe, you know, twelve dollars or $1,300. So it was indeed cheaper than, than a cement truck. Now, that's obviously varying in some places. Um, it could be anywhere from, you know, Nine hundred dollars to maybe fifteen hundred, right? Just depending on the mix quality, all that stuff. And I don't know what rocks they're using. I know I'm using mason sand, a very high, high quality sand, and also a bridgestone, a, a almost like a granite type rock, uh, three fourths inch, uh, screened or whatever. Now I know the, the the quality is is very good. I know the mix is good. You know I can I'm responsible entirely for it. And I know they have tickets and everything to show what's going on. But if I were to do a cement truck, it might be maybe a hundred, two hundred dollars cheaper. I also have to have the manpower to be able to do that, right? So we got to think, you know, who, who's coming over and helping the other three guys I'm gonna have out there, you know, buying lunch or, or paying them or whatever. So yeah, you know, I'm having people there helping me, but. I'm just having wood buckets and hang out, right? Nothing too crazy. Just putting some sand in the bucket. This is not including materials either, right? You gotta also keep in mind, I bought the bull float. I've had the cement mixer already. I bought a placer. Um, you know, all these little tools and things, the buckets I didn't have, I went and bought. That factors into the price also. However, I keep those after I'm done. So not only will it still be cheaper after, you know, getting somebody to come out and do it, but um, I also get a bunch of fun knickknacks that I can play with afterwards for many years to come. And you get the experience of doing it, right? But all that set aside, you also have to pay for delivery fees for said, um, said rock and sand. Now I brought the concrete or the cement, I'm sorry, the Portland cement to my you know, place of pouring uh, by myself with a trailer. You might not be able to do that with the sand and gravel. Matter of fact, it would, it would be pretty difficult to be able to move, you know, uh, nine cubic yards worth of materials. So something to consider, you're gonna have to pay a delivery fee, probably about $30, 30 to $60 for all that material. You'd factor that in, right? We're still under 1200. Um, yeah, so let's go ahead and get back to the video. Okay, so I'm um, just finished up putting up the forms. And you know, it looks really good. It looks really good. Um, these form boards are going to be reusable. So first we're going to pour this and then we'll be able to have just this form board right there. Pour that one. 
and then we're gonna move this one over here and then that one over there for that one and then this one you know what I'm saying now I didn't show any instruction on how we place the rebar the rebar was just half inch thick 20 foot rebar and some of it was kind of defective from the manufacturing line where it was a, a little bit larger you know it wasn't necessarily perfectly circular but I didn't feel like I needed to show you how I placed that I just put it in a grid two foot spacing I think four or five inches uh, from the edge of the form boards and the edges of the shed and then just use some um, some of those rebar chairs now because of the abnormalities with the rebar when we got it um, the rebar chairs didn't work too well so I ended up using them on the first and a little bit on the second but after that um, I just no longer continued to use those rebar chairs I just use zip ties and then funny enough the rebar from the concrete already poured kind of locks the rebar in place so it really doesn't want to move around too much just put a little rock or maybe a piece of a brick underneath to lift it up off you know and how high you want in the middle of the of the slab and you can see here when we first started pouring this section I actually poured it way too dry the mix was was very very hard you know I could I could almost walk on the mix um, so you know there's that issue but what's funny is is as I was pouring these sections for the slabs for the shed six sections in total 10 by 12 120 square foot per um, per section I, I was getting a lot better each time you know you can see me here using the hand trowel a whole lot or the, the, the hand float and um, I, I was sort of favoring that initially but I ended up using the big four four foot bull float as as time went on and I, I realized how much easier that was as well as the concrete placer and stuff um, really just started getting getting a lot better and you'll, you'll sort of see the quality progress so what I was actually doing here is I inserted some rebar splints into the first section of this pour I didn't have enough sand to finish this section so you know I had to do it in two parts I inserted that those splints into the rebar and, and, and cut them just a teeny bit so I could bend them at an angle and what that's going to do is give it more bite as that second section cures and and keep those two sections of the concrete from separating and what this is actually doing pouring it in two sections is putting a, putting the rebar in that slab under a lot of tension which as you know is is really how structural slabs are made they'll they'll put the rebar into an extreme amount of tension and that prevents the rebar or the concrete from breaking and buckling under you know certain types of loads I do feel like that's really gonna give me a lot more strength than usual now I didn't put those splints in other sections of the concrete I actually poured just about all of them in two sections um, it was really tough you know but yeah I didn't, I didn't do the splints and you can the, the amount of care I put in probably decreased as I went on just because I realized it wasn't that important um, you know I, I'm trying to get it smooth smooth to the best of my ability but I'd found that um, it's 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 working well right it's a nice solid foundation that doesn't get you know uh, wet and and dusty and and all these all these things I can walk on it roll a toolbox on it that's all I care about I'm happy I, I understand I'm cheaping out and it's not gonna be as good as a professional style of, of you know concrete and that's fine with me that's absolutely fine so that ended up hardening and you can see me here loading the buckets I'm alone right here anytime I had help maybe from Lindsay or, or a neighbor or you know family I would just have them load the buckets and then I would dump them into the mixer pour it smooth it out you know do all that stuff I, I just I really could have eliminated the need for any assistance just by buying more buckets but you know they're four or five dollars a piece so um, you know I didn't want to spend another fifty to a hundred dollars on buckets I just have somebody come out and, and kinda of keep me company while I'm doing it but um, yeah like I said this this is pretty much a solo concrete pour I mean I'm doing all of the concrete work it's just somebody putting gravel and sand into a bucket for me and a little bit of concrete what I was doing with the buckets is I would have one bucket filled all the way five gallons of of the Bridgestone gravel and then I'd have another bucket filled up four parts or four gallons of sand and then the top of last gallon would be of the Portland cement so uh, you can convert the mix ratio you know based on what kind of concrete you're wanting I think that mix is somewhere around an M15 M10 grade of concrete which is you know not necessarily the highest quality but um, for, a, for a slab you know a little foundation non load bearing should be perfectly fine right so you can see here me just kinda going after it you know getting it done
It's also worth mentioning just how fast this concrete was setting up. A lot faster than I had ever anticipated it would. When I first started pouring it, I thought I was going to be able to do each section in one pour, but, you know, I found out later that wasn't the case. Um, it's very, very difficult to get a perfect finish doing this alone. Some might even say impossible, because what you're doing is pouring a certain section, and then that section will harden up as you're pouring the other sections, so when you go back to float it or, or trowel it or whatever you want to put that finish on it, uh, you're working with very uneven surfaces in terms of um, viscosity, right? So, you know, that was that was a big problem for me. As well as when it's fully hardened, you can see here how I'm, I'm trying to work those corners and get them smooth and, and to meet up flat. It was possible, but the large rocks in the concrete actually made it, you know, very, very difficult to smooth it out with that with that taper, right? As I'm trying to put them, put them you know, next to each other, uh, it was just really difficult. A way to avoid that, obviously, would be to make the drop-off where you stop the concrete just a perfectly flat, you know, no taper. Or you could even come back later with a sand and cement mix, kind of like a mortar type deal, and then use that and, and trowel it out and get it flat. And that, that's another thing to keep in mind here. You can see a lot of this isn't perfectly level. You know, there's a little bit of scuffs and everything. Once you're done with the slab, you can always come back and burnish it or, you know, buy, rent one of those Tenant 5680s with the uh, those pads on it, the burnishing pads, and you can just, you know, um, grind everything down. And then uh, you could pour your epoxy, epoxy floor on that, or you could even do another really thin layer of uh, just sand and cement. And then you'll get a new, get a new surface. And I also forgot to mention that in the concrete mixer, I'm actually adding four buckets per pour. So that'd be 20 gallons total of mix. 10 gallons of gravel, 8 gallons of sand, and then 2 gallons of the Portland cement. And for you people in the UK, um, or anywhere else in the world rather, <laughs> you're, you're going to have to convert that. Okay, so... With that, I think we're going to go ahead and conclude part one. Um, you see me working hard in here, getting this section poured and then that other section poured. I ended up having Lindsay help me on this first section and my neighbor, good friend of mine, help me on that other side. I'm going to go ahead and save this for part two. And uh, I'll do that last part, part three. And I might very well even put in plumbing on that, on that section right there for part three for maybe a bathroom and a sink, stuff like that. Um, you can see here we got some, some rudimentary power set up. And, uh, you know, I'm getting all my tools in here, getting it looking good. Uh, you know, I just about cried when I put these lights up. It was so beautiful. I, you know, I couldn't believe it. And, of course, that's not... <laughs> I wouldn't consider it uh, permanent either. But just about everything in here is temporary. Just sort of organizing everything. And, you know, once this section's poured, I can move everything here. And, you know, I, I had a lot of stuff coming in that I had to get inside the shed, I didn't have anywhere else to put it. So, you know, I, I just, we gotta make do with what, what we got. I hope you enjoyed this part one. I could condense all these videos into, into one video, but it would be too long and let's face it, nobody would watch it anyway. And for the, <laughs> you know, um, for those of you who have been sticking around watching the progress, thanks for watching. Um, for those of you who are, who are new to the channel, you know, go ahead and subscribe. We're doing all kinds of fun stuff here. And we're doing it, you know, all by ourselves, right? With, with the help of a few neighbors or friends or a family, you know. So it's a good time. No no debt, no, no contractors, none of that nonsense. We don't need any of that. We're doing it all, you know. So go ahead and stick around for part two. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.